We're pleased now to welcome to the stage Clay Pruitt. Hello. I use that slide so I can remind myself to establish a little bit of um, a little bit of a connection to the audience. Uh, but on the other hand, right before I came up here, I was reminded by a really good friend of mine that you are the only thing standing between us and lunch. So, with both of those things in mind, um, the thing that I'm here to talk to you about today is something that you all want, something we all want. It's something we all need. It's something we work all week trying to make and spending a whole lot of time wondering if we'll ever have enough of it. And that one thing, as you could probably guess, is money. Now, the thing about money is that there's always somebody who's trying to get it. Am I right? Uh, I'm not talking about Boy Scout fundraisers. I'm not talking about the IRS. I'm talking about advertisers and marketers. They want your money and they pay big money to get it. Now, uh, when, when advertisers and marketers, you know, they, 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 oh, I went too far there. Let me go back. Uh, but if you think that money is the most valuable asset that you have, then you need to think again. <laughs> because money is not the most valuable asset you have. There is one asset that is much more valuable than money, and that is your attention. Because every good marketer knows that if they can't get your attention, they'll never get your money. And the problem with that is, is that, uh, you know, uh, your, your, your attention only goes so far, right? There's a lot more competition from, for your attention now than there's ever been. Consider this. In the 1970s, your life looked a whole lot like this. But today, in 2017, your life looks like this, and 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 all these things. Don't forget about Pinterest. And we wonder why, we wonder why attention spans aren't what they used to be, right? So in 24 hours, consider this, in 24 hours, you'll be subjected to roughly 20,000 messages. You've read texts, you've read emails, you've probably been on social media, which means you know who has a birthday today, you know who's been on vacation, who had the most exquisite truffle-crusted beef wellington, you know who loves President Trump, you know who hates President Trump, and you know who put their cat... I think I... Oh, I'm back now. There we go. Now, that's just... That's just the, the overall messaging. That's not even including the advertising. Now, when it comes to advertising, in one day, you will be exposed to brands more than 5,000 times. 5,000 brand exposures. Think about that. You, every time you open your refrigerator or the, your, your kitchen cupboard, you'll see logos. You see logos every time you brush your teeth, even when you put on your pants. You see you, there are uh, television, adver television advertisements radio advertisements, billboards. You, you see ads all over the place. And then that's not even including online because online you see banner ads. You see paid sponsored content and paid social posts. And those things, you know, they're not very expensive. In fact, they literally cost less than a cent, two hundredths of a cent, as little as two hundredths of a cent. All those things are called impressions. But the big question is, how many of those impressions actually made an impression on you? Now, this, this idea of, uh, of these, these impressions, you know, they, they come and they go, and uh, the answer to that question is out of 5,000, only 12 of those impressions are actually going to be something that you take home, with yourself, take home and you actually remember. 12 out of 5,000. And that's why it's, it's so important for advertisers and marketers to, to recognize this and recognize that we are always overloaded. Our attention is, our attention is becoming scarce. So they have to do something to, 
they have to do something to really break through. And that attention is just the beginning because that attention leads to, uh, you have to, you, the, capturing someone's attention just, is just the start because then you have to develop their interest. You have to create a connection and that connection ultimately leads to some sort of action. But I would say that the most important part of that process is actually making you remember. Because if you don't remember, then it didn't do any good to get your attention in the first place. Now, keep clicking, clicking double here. And how do advertisers and marketers actually make you remember something? They tell you a story. Now think about it. Throughout our history, the most, uh, the most influential people have always been storytellers. They are responsible for shaping our society, shaping our culture, shaping our history. Think about it. William Shakespeare, Mark Twain, and possibly the most influential storyteller of all time, who is Jesus. Jesus told parables, and why did he do that? Because Jesus even knew that messages are easily forgotten. But when you take that message and you wrap it up into a parable, into a story, it makes it real, and it makes it relevant, and it makes it something that people will remember. And that's what's so great about a story. It can make you laugh. It can make you cry. It can make you proud. It can make you scared. It can teach you a lesson. And it can capture your imagination. Because even today, just like 2,000 years ago, people don't want to be told. They want to be entertained. Now, I know some of the data-minded people in the room are going to have a problem with this next slide, but this is a graph that's based on one person's research. And this says, for every, the, more, the more a brand tries to sell you something, the less fun it is to watch. And I feel like that's, obviously it's anecdotal and being a little facetious here, but it's really true. The more you try to sell me on something, the less fun I'm having watching it. Consider these, uh, these examples, uh, but with, when brands try to, when brands try to, uh, they tell you a story, they're trying to create a, a, a shared value. They're trying to create a connection because when a brand's values line up with your values, it makes you feel good about that brand. One example is the Dove Real Beauty campaign. They didn't say, hey, you should really buy Dove soap. They said, every person is beautiful. And if you believe that every person is beautiful, well, then you believe what we believe. So we have that in common with you. Here's another campaign that I've always been very fond of. The Dos Equis, most interesting man in the world. The most interesting, never in, this, never in this campaign, never once did they say buy Dos Equis beer. No, they just told you about a very, very interesting guy who doesn't always drink beer, but when he does, he prefers Dos Equis. And by the way, he bowls overhand. <laughs> Another campaign that I wish, I wish I had written is the Chick-fil-A campaign. Because sure, it's about why you should buy chicken, but who better to tell you to buy, who, to, who better to tell you that you should eat more chicken than some cows who don't want to be eaten themselves? And finally, a campaign that I am especially close to the Farm Bureau Insurance Farmer Charlie campaign. Now, it's not so much about buying insurance, it's about telling you that farmers are very wise people. And the wisest advice that a farmer could give you is that you don't have to be a farmer to buy Farm Bureau insurance. Again, it's not about selling. It's not about selling at all. It's about making you feel good about the brand. And then, that's what we call building brand affinity. Once you start to feel good about the brand and you start to in, be enveloped in it and embrace it, that brand affinity, it balloons into what we call brand ambassadorship. And you become an ambassador. And that's what brings us back to why your attention is even more, even more uh, valuable than, than your money is because you, you become an ambassador and you start to talk about these products. You start to share these products and you start to tell your friends and eventually you're not just buying a product, you're helping to sell it. And so then the, 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 that's, what's, that's what's so great is that it eventually it turns into you becoming 
creating, creating a further step in that lineage of helping to sell a product to others. You become an ambassador. And that's what's so great about storytelling. You know, it's, it's not always that easy. It's not always, it's not always so easy. But, uh, you know, we all have our own story to tell. Whether it's a job interview or uh, asking someone out on a date or making new friends, we all have our own story to tell. And that's why it's so important for us to tell our own story effectively and to be successful and, and to, be, uh, to, to tell a compelling and memorable story is because we are all our own brand. Now, how do we tell that story more effectively and make it more memorable? Number one, focus the message. A wise person once said, say one thing and say it well. Now, I thought that person was David Ogilvy, but I had some trouble attributing that when I was putting this presentation together. But whoever it was was a very wise person because that's really true. Aren't we all guilty of trying to say too much sometimes even in advertising? Think about the last time you saw a billboard that had a message on it, a number of different logos, a phone number, a URL, and what did you take away from it? Probably not all of that stuff, maybe a piece here and there, but definitely not all of it. And that's why it's important to say one thing and say it well and focus our message. And I equate this to an analogy that I call the tennis ball analogy. If I were to toss you one tennis ball, you'd catch it. But if I were to toss you 50 tennis balls all at the same time, you'd probably miss all of them. So focus your message. Number two, simplify. When I started in the advertising business, we lived in a world of 30 and 60 seconds. That's a 30-second TV spot or a 60-second radio spot. And if you've ever tried to write a 30-second radio spot, you'll know it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to get all the information in there that you want to include. But that was 15 years ago. Times have changed since then because 30 seconds is an incredibly long amount of time. That's why Vine said, how about videos that are only six seconds long? And that's why Twitter said, how about messages that are only 140 characters long? And that's why Instagram said, ah, screw it, just give me one picture. So it's incredibly important to simplify your message. And it's becoming more and more important as time goes on. Think about it. Younger generations, they crave simplicity as much as any of us. Don't believe me? May I present Exhibit A? Number three, this goes without saying, but it's very important to be different. Find a, find a different way to tell your story or tell a completely different story. Find a uh, different perspective or a different voice to tell it from. Find a different character to tell it. I know it's really easy to say, to say we should be different, but then when it comes to when it comes to putting the pen to paper and, you know, like really putting the idea together and being different, a lot of brands and a lot of people don't really have the guts to do it. So being different is all about having the guts to actually be different. And if you can do that, that's when you can start to stand out. And finally, don't be afraid of the unexpected. Why? Because the, unex because the expected is boring. And boring is forgettable. So, by reason of deduction, if we can be unexpected, then we can be unboring. And by being unboring, we can be unforgettable. Now, I will conclude with a story that is my attempt to be one of those 12 things out of 5,000 or 20,000 or how many ever, however many uh, messages you're exposed to today, to be one of those 12 things that you can remember, and I'd like to tell you a story to do that. In the early 1900s, Thousands and thousands of immigrants came to the United States, Jewish immigrants came to the United States from Eastern Europe in search of a better life. Uh, and one of those immigrants was a fellow by the name of Morris Silverman. Now, Morris Silverman in his homeland of the Ukraine was what's called a shamus. And uh, if you don't know what a shamus is, it's uh, essentially a person who is the rabbi's helper in the synagogue, and that's what Morris Silverman was. He was the rabbi's helper. So he comes to the United States, and he's living in New York City, and he's uh, almost penniless, has barely any money to his name. But he hears about a job opening for a shamus at the Second Street Synagogue. And, oh, wow, this is perfect. 
Morris runs right down to the Second Street Synagogue, goes right in, applies for the job. They put him through the, the battery of interview questions, and they think, wow, this guy's great. He's perfect. He's going to be great. And, but before we give you the job, you can read and write, can't you? And Morris said, I'm sorry, I was an orphan. I have no formal education. Uh, I, can, I can pray, but no, I'm sorry, I, I can't read and write. And they said, well, I, I, we're really sorry. I mean, you, f- you have all the other qualifications, but this is the United States. You have to be able to read and write. Morris said, I can't. And they said, well, we're sorry. We can't, can't give you the job. So Morris Silverman walks out of the Second Street Synagogue devastated, absolutely dejected. And he's thinking about what he could possibly do with his life to, to, you know, to, to, uh, to make some money and pursue the American dream. And so he goes down the street and he finds someone selling a needle and thread and he buys the needle and thread from that person. And then he walks back up the street and he sells that needle and thread for a small profit. But instead of spending that money on himself, he goes back and he buys more needle and thread. And he walks back up the street and he sells the needle and thread for a slight profit. And he keeps doing this until by the end of the week, he's got a whole tray with needles and thread and fabric and thimbles. And that tray became a push cart. And that push cart became a storefront. And Morris Silverman made so much money with that storefront that soon he was able to pay, he was able to buy the whole building that he that the storefront was in. And it was at that point that Morris Silverman realized his true calling because he made so much money with that building that he was able to purchase the next building over and then the next building and then the next building until the time came for Morris Silverman to make the biggest business deal of his life. However, to do so, he needed $1 million. And in the early 1900s, if you wanted to borrow $1 million, there was only one place that you could go, and that was the Chase Manhattan Bank. So Morris Silverman goes to the Chase Manhattan Bank. And who greets him in the lobby? None other than John D. Rockefeller himself. And he grabs Morris Silverman by the arm and he walks him up to his office and they sit down at this big, across, across from each other at this big mahogany desk. And John D. Rockefeller looks at Morris Silverman and he says, Morris, you are the epitome of the American spirit. You came to this country with no money and yet you have become one of the most successful real estate men in the, in the city. You're an inspiration to me, and it would be my honor to loan you $1 million. So John D. Rockefeller reaches down, and he grabs this big leather-bound checkbook, and he sets it on the desk, and he turns it around, and he slides it across the table, and he pulls out a pen, and he gives it to Morris Silverman, and he says, here, I want you to fill out this check for however much money you need, and I would be delighted and honored to loan you that amount of money. Morris Silverman takes the pen. He looks at the pen, and he looks down at the checkbook. He looks back at the pen, and he looks back at Mr. Rockefeller, and he says, I'm really embarrassed, but I never learned to read and write, so I actually can't fill out this check. And Mr. Rockefeller said, My God, man, you're one of the most successful real estate men in New York City and you can't read or write? His mind was blown. He said, Morris, do you realize what you could have been if you could only read and write? And Morris said, Yeah, I could have been a shamus at the Second Street Synagogue. (laughs) Thank you very much.